with you tonight on a Monday night. I'm so glad that you came. What a wonderful blessing to be in the house of God. Amen? And I know that we have some visitors amongst us. I see some friends from over in Euclid. How many of you Euclidians are there here tonight? There's a bunch of you here tonight. Good. I'm so glad that you all came. And I know that we have folks from various and sundry places. Thank you for coming. I'm so glad that you took the time to be in the house of God on a Monday night. And I can't help but think that the Lord himself is pleased uh, when we go out of our way to honor him and to serve him and to love him. My uh, wife and children are gone. Some of you asked, are they, uh, are they still here? Is your wife going to sing tonight? And the answer is no. They left this morning. After what I said last night, <laughs> they took off this morning. No, they had planned... Uh, Already, We had planned that they would go over and uh, her sister lives in Indiana and her father is going to be flying in tomorrow morning and they're going to go over and spend some time with grandpa for a few days this next week and then they will fly out to Virginia next week and meet me there in our revival meeting there in Virginia. But she sends her regards and uh, actually she sends her regrets as well. She says she wished she could have been here tonight and, and on through the week but when you get the chance to do those things and you're on the road all the time, you just go ahead and make the time to do those things. And so she enjoyed being here yesterday in spite of last night. And uh, if you don't know what that's all about, you'll just have to ask somebody. You'll just have to ask somebody because I'm not going to say it again. I'm just not saying it again. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Matthew, chapter number 7. Matthew, chapter 7. And when you find Matthew, chapter 7, would you stand with me? As we read the Word of God tonight, Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for a beautiful day that you gave to us today. Thank you for an opportunity to be in your house tonight and open your word and see truth. And God, tonight I pray we would indeed see truth from your perspective. Lord, I don't know the hearts of the people standing here in this room right now, but you do. And it could well be that there would be some standing here right now that have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And if that is the case, I pray they would not walk out of this building in that condition but that tonight they would humble themselves before you and be saved. And we'll thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Verse number 13 is an interesting verse. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Now, of course, that could be the destruction of a life and ruined life and opportunities, but it's far more than just that. Because that destruction is eternal destruction in an awful place that the Bible calls hell. You don't hear an awful lot about hell anymore, it seems. When I was a child growing up in church, we heard about hell quite often. It was not unusual to have messages on hell, and, and we heard it a lot. And I think we probably don't hear it nearly as much as we ought to hear it nowadays. Instead, now we, we prefer to just kind of pass over that and, and talk about other things. But the truth is, there is a hell. There's a hell, and it's a real place, and it's an awful place. And the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, the most loving person that ever walked the face of the earth, spoke more about hell than He did about heaven. So it must be important. It surely must be important. There's a lot of confusion about hell today. If you were to go out on the street tomorrow and, and ask ten different people to tell you about hell, you would get ten different responses. You really would. Some would say there's no such thing. It's just a fairy tale made up by religious people to scare people into doing what they want them to do. There are folks who believe that. There are others who believe that, that hell is just a, a figment of the imagination or, or hell is, I've heard folks say, all the bad things that happen to you in your life, that's, that's your hell. And all the good things that happen to you in your life, that's your heaven. And that's as far as it goes. I'm afraid it goes far beyond that. Far beyond that. 
I've heard other folks talk about about something that, that just does away with hell altogether. And, and it's getting more and more popular today. And it's called reincarnation. The idea that you just, when you die, you float around and come back as something else. It's an interesting idea. I actually met a guy once that believed that. And I had never met one in face, person to person. And I, I knocked on his door. We were out witnessing, and it was actually in uh, in Alaska. And I knocked on the guy's door, and he came to his to his door, and and I began to witness to him. Handed him a track and all that. He said, "I'm not interested. Uh, I don't believe all that stuff." He said, "I believe in reincarnation." And I did what you're not supposed to do when you're knocking on people's doors. I said, "Really? <laughs> Tell me about it." I had never heard anybody who actually claimed to believe it be able to tell me what it was all about. So I said, tell me about it. And he proceeded to tell me about it. He said, if you do pretty good, when you die, you come back a little better. Maybe somebody with a, a little more stuff or a little better position or you come back better and better until you reach a state of nirvana. I thought that sounds pretty good. So what happens if you don't do so well? He said, you come back worse. I said, really? Worse? Maybe, maybe somebody who has physical problems or maybe somebody who's destitute or uh, you, do, you come back worse. I said, what, what happens if you just keep getting worse? He said, well, you can come back as an animal. I said, wow, an animal. What if, what if you're a bad animal? <laughs> My mother has two chihuahuas. I know there are bad animals in this world. What if you're one of those? There's no hope for you. What if you're a bad animal? He said, I'm not really sure. Maybe you could come back as a, as a plant. I said, really? A plant? What if you're, what if you're a bad plant? What if you just happen to be poison ivy? What if you're a, what if you're a tree that falls and squashes somebody's yugo? What, what if you're a bad plant? He said, well, I guess, I guess ultimately you could come back as a rock. I said, wow. That's kind of final once you come back as a rock. I think, I think you're kind of stuck then. I don't know what happens. I, I'm sure glad that's not true. Listen, if that were true, we'd be in sorry shape tonight, wouldn't we? You know what would be sitting out here in these pews tonight? Big rocks, little rocks, sand, dirt. Maybe some poison ivy, but that's as good as it'd get right there. Just lots and lots of rocks. Oh boy, I'm glad that's not true because you know deep in your heart that you're not getting better and better. You look at the world around you, it's not getting better and better. It's getting worse and worse. I'm glad that's not the case. I heard, a, I heard somebody once talking about heaven and hell, and they said there's a real heaven, and, and God dwells there, and good people go there, and, and there's a real hell, and, and it's awful and terrible, and bad people go there. And then there's kind of a halfway holding tank in the middle, where if you're not so bad and you're not so good, you kind of land in there. And you can pay your way out or pray your way out or put in your time and crawl out, but it's halfway in between. Now, that's an interesting idea. Problem is, you won't find that even hinted at in this book. That's a complete fairy tale. It's not even in this book anywhere. Not even suggested in that book. I heard another guy on the radio. Actually, I was driving through Ohio. Going across the, the toll road, the width of Ohio, and, and I was headed for a meeting, and it was early, early Sunday morning, and I had the, I had the radio on, and I, I came across this preacher, and he was preaching on hell, and he was doing a good job. He was just letting her fly. He was just preaching away about hell. And then he, he said something that kind of shocked me. He said, some people believe that when you go to hell, you stay there forever, but that's not true. He said, you're only in hell long enough to pay for the sins you've committed. And then you're just burned up and annihilated. Well, now, that's an interesting concept. But you won't find that in this book either. It's not, the Bible knows nothing of a, of a short-term hell or a small time period spent in hell. The Bible knows nothing of that. So there's a lot of confusion about it tonight. But can we agree that what this book says is right? What this book says is true. And I want to show you tonight from the Word of God the truth about hell. Not my ideas about hell or somebody's opinions about hell, but what does the Word of God say about this place called hell? And I'm going to ask you to turn to a lot of passages tonight. I'm doing that on purpose because I want you to see with your own eyes what the Bible says about this place called hell. I don't want you to walk out of here saying, well, Brother Rogers believes this or this or this about hell. What I believe about hell doesn't really matter. 
What this book says about hell matters. Matters to you and to me and to our friends and our neighbors and our family. First of all, I want to show you tonight the trap of hell. Look at verse 13 again, Matthew chapter 7. Enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. It paints the picture of a broad, easy way that leads to eternal destruction. You know what that is? That's a trap. That's a trap. I don't know how many of you are trappers. Probably not very many. I'm from Alaska, and we, we actually have a couple trappers in my home church. Men who make their living trapping animals and, yes, I don't want to get too dra graphic, but they take the skins off and, and make stuff out of them. Really, that's where leather and fur comes from, is little nice fuzzy animals. I know that hurts some folks' sensibilities, but that's where it comes from. And we have some guys in the church that do that. I, I, I was actually a trapper for a while. I probably don't look like your mental picture of a trapper. I would hope not. I trapped, I trapped squirrels. I trapped squirrels. I, of course, grew up in the, in the little area of Saldatna, Alaska, and, and it's kind of out in the sticks. At least at that time, it was kind of out in the sticks. And, and as a kid, I was fascinated. I've always loved animals. I was fascinated with the squirrels. And we had these big 55-gallon barrels out by the woods that we would put our trash in. And when they filled up, we would haul them to the dump, dump them out, bring them back, fill them up again. That's what we did. And the squirrels would come out of the trees and they would get in those barrels and they would get food out of those barrels. And so I got one of those cages, a wire cage trap and put it on the, on the trash barrel and put bread inside the trap. And the squirrels would come and they would step on the little trap door and they would go inside and get the bread. And then I would come and let them out of the cage, feed them some more by hand. And when they were full, they would run back up the trees. I would reset the trap. That's what we did. Over and over and over. I spent summers doing that, just catching squirrels over and over. One, one day I went to my dad, I said, Dad, I think I might be catching the same squirrels. <laughs> How am I going to tell them apart? You've seen one little squirrel, you've seen them all. We have these little, we don't have big gray squirrels and black squirrels and all those big fluffy squirrels. We have little bitty red squirrels. They're about this long, about that big around. And I, I said, Dad, uh, they all look the same. How am I going to know if I'm catching the same squirrel? He said, there's some spray paint out in the garage. So we not only had red squirrels, we had candy apple red squirrels. And we had blue squirrels, and we had green squirrels, and we had... My favorites were the metallic gold and silver. Because they shined in the treetops as they, as they chirped and squawked. Now, I, I know that's not very environmentally friendly, I know that, but I was just a child doing what my father said, so you can't hold that against me. And what happened to those squirrels after they chewed the paint off? That's between them and God, I have no idea. No idea. So they'd come down and get the bread, and I'd let them out. And I just did it so I could feed them by hand and get close to the squirrels. I just enjoyed animals. And, and every spring, there'd be a new crop of baby squirrels. And those little baby squirrels would come down, and they didn't know the drill. They didn't know I was going to let them out. They didn't know I was going to feed them more. They didn't understand how it all worked. And they were afraid. And they'd come down, and they were afraid to get in that cage, and they would circle it. And they'd circle it all day long. They'd come down, they'd circle the cage, they'd go back in the trees. They'd come down, they'd circle the cage, they'd go back in the trees. And then finally they'd get up enough courage and they'd start to go in the doorway and step on the little trap door and they'd see that pile of bread in there and they'd come back out. And sooner or later, their curiosity would get the best of them. And they'd go in and they'd get inside and the trap door would shut. And then they would realize they were caught. As soon as they realized they were caught, they were no longer interested in the bread. All of a sudden, all they were interested in is getting out of the cage. And they would just get frantic sometimes. And they would try to chew their way through the cage. And they would try to force themselves through the little holes in the cage. And, and they would, they would just, just many times hurt, their, hurt themselves trying to get out of the cage. They didn't know I was just going to come let them go. That's a trap. There will be an awful lot of nice folks who walk through this life without the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they take their last breath and they step off into eternity and the trap is sprung. And there is no escape. And it's too late then to figure out what happened. It's too late. It's a trap. It's as broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. 
It is a trap. I want to I want to give you not only the trap of hell, but the terror of hell. It's a place of darkness. You're in Matthew chapter 7. Look at chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse number 12. It says, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness. Have you ever been in a place that's completely dark? I visited a few caves around the country. They're interesting, but they're all the same. They always take you down to the very bottom of the cave, as deep as you can go. And then they tell you to stand still. And then they turn the lights off. And then after a few seconds, they turn the lights back on. You know why they do that? Because if they didn't, people would get frantic. If we turned off the lights in this building, there would be enough light coming in through those windows up top that in just a few seconds, our eyes would adjust and we'd be able to walk around in here without hurting ourselves and whacking our legs on the pews. You get down in one of those caves and turn the lights off and you cannot see your hand in front of your face. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. You've probably heard people say, well, all all my friends are going to hell. I'll know lots of people. You won't see anybody there. Outer darkness. Well, I'll I'll be able to get together with... No, 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 no. You won't be able to have conversations with your friends. You won't be able to talk to people. As a matter of fact, the only thing you're going to hear is weeping and gnashing of teeth in the midst of that darkness. It's a horrible, horrible place. Not only is it a place of darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 9. Revelation chapter number 9. It's a place of fear. Revelation chapter number 9. Look, if you would, at verse number 1. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit. Have you thought about that very much? The bottomless pit. No stopping, no ending place, no, no bottom at all. It's, it's a bottomless pit. Have you ever fallen? You know that feeling that goes through you? Even if you just start to fall. Just start to fall. I don't know how it is here in the Cleveland area, but I know that in Alaska, we have to shovel our roofs off at least a couple times in the winter. Because the snow piles up and then what's on the bottom starts to melt from the the heat of the roof. And then next thing you know, you have a layer of ice under there. and, And if it gets built up too far, it'll just collapse the entire structure. So when you start to get a certain amount of snow built up on the roof, you get up there and you shovel it off. Usually the time to do that is when we are uh, in Alaska visiting my mother at Christmas time. It seems like that's when that needs to be done. And so it gets done. But it's one of those things where, you know, I I kind of enjoy it. You get up there on the roof and you you got your big shovel and, and you're just shoveling it off. You just get down to the edge and you make a big pile and you get a big enough pile, you just jump off the roof and it's very exciting. But you're, you're up there running around like a mountain goat, just as nimble as can be. I mean, you're just doing a great job. And then all of a sudden, one foot slips just a tiny bit. You don't fall. It's just one foot that slips just a little tiny bit. And your whole attitude changes just like that. You go from running around up on the roof, nimble as a mountain goat, to suddenly down down close where you can grab onto it if you start to fall. And you get that rush of adrenaline and, and your life flashes before your eyes all because your foot just slipped a tiny, tiny little bit. Falling is a horrible, horrible feeling. Hell is a bottomless pit that you'll be plunged into. I have a couple great desires in life. One of them is bungee jumping. I want to bungee jump. I have never accomplished that. And I'm getting old now. I'm, I'm old as dirt. I'm 46. And if I don't, I don't sense some sympathy for some of you. And if I don't bungee jump soon, it'll be too late. It'll just be too late. I want to be able to walk the next day. Now, now I'm, not, I'm not crazy. I want somebody heavier and taller than me to go off first. Have to be heavier and taller. And they can go off first, and if they're all right, then I can go. I don't want to be the guy where they discover that the rope is six inches too long, and you go... I don't think that's a good way to meet God. I really don't. It'd be hard to explain that, wouldn't it? Stand in heaven, and he says, you're not supposed to be here. He says, I know, I know. 
I was bungee jumping and the rope was that much too long. And here I am. I, I, I don't want to go through that. It's not, not my idea of a good way to go to heaven. But I do want to do it. I, I want to bungee jump. I, I want to make sure it's safe. As a matter of fact, before we got married, I said to Liz, you need to understand. And you, you can ask her. I did. I said, you need to understand that I want to bungee jump. If that's going to be a problem, you better tell me now. She said, it's not a problem as long as I don't have to go with you. I said, okay. All right, then we're good. And we got married and it was wonderful. Amen. You've got to have priorities in life. You really do. I've never done it, but I got close. I was preaching out in Boise, Idaho. And it was the end of August and the state fair was in town. And, and they, had a, they had a soul winning booth at the state fair and everything. And, and the meeting was over and the, I was hanging around an extra day. And, and the preacher said, tonight, let's, let's go down to the soul winning booth and we'll spend some time witnessing to folks. And, and then we'll just we'll catch dinner down there at the fair. I thought, that, that's wonderful. There are a few places as good to catch dinner than, than the fair. I mean, they have stuff at the fair you can't get anywhere else. You can't walk into the average restaurant and order the kind of stuff they have at the fair. Everything's dripping grease. I mean, just, it's wonderful. Those big old elephant ear things, you know, with gunk all over them and big old ice cream, big old cow legs, deep fried. You just walk around chewing on them. And just wonderful. And the grease drips down your arms. That's good stuff. I said, yes, let's do that. And so we did. We went down to the booth and, and we spent some time witnessing to some folks and had a wonderful time. And then the preacher said, uh, why don't you guys go, go get some food? I said, all right. So I, I went with the assistant pastor. We were walking around the fair, picking our food. And we got our food and it's just dripping everywhere. And we're just having a wonderful time. And, and, and we saw the biggest thing at the fair, two big metal poles way up in the sky, higher than the Ferris wheel. And between the big metal poles was a big rubber band thing. And then there was a, a metal cage in the middle. And they would pull that down to the bottom and they would shoot it up into the sky. It was amazing. The assistant pastor's son, I guess he was probably 12 or 13 at that time. He said, Dad, I, I want to do that. And his father said, no, you don't. He said, that's, that's not even smart. He said, Brother Rogers wouldn't do that. I said, uh, <laughs> yes, I would. He said, would you take my son? I said, sure, I'll take him. I'll take him. By this time, it was 10 o'clock at night. It was very, very dark, except for the lightning everywhere in the sky. Big, big thunderstorm moving through lightning everywhere. And so we got over there by the big metal poles. And when the lightning came, they made us get away from the metal poles. And then the lightning would stop and somebody would run up and sit in there and they'd shoot them into the sky. And the lightning would start and we'd run back away from the metal poles. And pretty soon people started to filter away. They got tired of that kind of thing. And so it was our opportunity. They, the lightning stopped and he said, who's next? And we ran up there and we sat in the thing. And he strapped us in. He strapped in our legs and he strapped in our chests and he strapped us back. And that probably should have been my first clue that things were going to be rough. And then he closed the lid on the cage and he reached over and grabbed that big lever and he began to pull it. And he pulled it and he pulled it. And all of a sudden he got to that one point and we shot up into the sky. And we were just flinging up into the sky, into the darkness and the blackness. And we got all the way to the top and it just kind of stopped there. And then it began to spin around in a circle. And then it started coming down. And it came down, 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 down it came. And it looked like we were going to smack right into those people on the ground. And just before we smacked into those people, it grabbed us and it jerked us back up to the top. And up we went into the silence, except for the kids screaming right next to me. Up we went up into the darkness and the blackness. And then down we came and up we went and down we came and up we went. And finally it was over. And we got out of there. One of the one of the folks at the church asked me the next day, they said, you'll probably never do that again, will you? I said, yeah, I think I would. <laughs> However, the next day I couldn't turn my head to either side. And I couldn't, I could barely lift my own suitcase because I couldn't lift my arm. I just had to carry it down here like this. So I'm going to have to bungee jump soon, very soon, very soon. But it's exciting to do that. I, I know what some of you are thinking right now. That's not exciting. That's not fun. That's just weird. 
No, it's fun. You see, you see all those other people do it and you know it's going to be okay. You get all the bouncing up and down and all that stuff and flying through the air and you know it's only going to last a few minutes and then it's going to stop and you'll be able to get out and walk away. Listen, should you die without Christ and step off into that bottomless pit, there will never ever be anything to reach in and grab you and pull you out. There will never be any stopping place. That horrible feeling of falling will just continue forever and ever and ever. It is indeed a bottomless pit. It's a place of terror, darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth and fear and falling into that awful bottomless pit. But let me go a little further and give you some of the torments of hell. In Luke chapter 16, verse number 24, the rich man lift up his eyes in hell and he said, I am tormented in this flame. There's fire in hell. There's fire. You say, I, I, I heard somebody preach on hell once and, and they said it didn't, when it says fire, it doesn't really mean fire. That's just, that's just figurative language and, and it doesn't really mean that. I told you tonight I wasn't going to give you my ideas. I was going to tell you what the Bible says and the Bible said, I am tormented in this flame. I just happen to believe that God has a big vocabulary. And if God had wanted to say something other than that, he would have said something other than that. But he said there were flames there in that place. If you're still in the book of Revelation, look at chapter 9, verse number 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit. As the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. It's a place with fire. It's a place with smoke. Have you ever been around a, a campfire and, and had the wind change and suddenly the smoke hits you right in the face? And you can't breathe and you can't talk and your eyes begin to water and you begin to choke and cough? Hell's going to be full of smoke. Full of smoke. I want you to look now at Revelation chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse number 10, because I want to show you where the smoke comes from. Verse 10 says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The smoke of their torment. Please notice it doesn't say the smoke of the torment. It says the smoke of their torment. When the truth is you will live forever. We are eternal beings and you will live forever. When you leave this life, you will either live forever in the presence of God in heaven or you will live forever in the torments of hell. But you will go on forever. If you go to heaven, you're going to get what we call a glorified body. It won't get sick, won't get old, it won't die. It'll be a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you go to hell, I don't know exactly how it'll all work, but you will have an eternal form in hell. And it won't die either. It won't die either. But it will feel pain. And it will be eternal, so it will feel just as much pain on the hundredth year as it did on the first day. And the flames in that place will burn those people in that place. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Real flames, real smoke. You say, hold it, if, if there were people burning in that place, they would eventually be burned up. That's just how fire works. Please remember with me the book of Exodus. You remember Moses out in the wilderness. And he comes across a bush that is on fire, real fire, a real bush that is burning. But the bush is never consumed and the fire just continues to burn. God has done that before. And that's how it will be in this place.
There's fire there. There's smoke there. Then in Mark chapter number 9, verses 44, 46, and 48, it says, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Again, it speaks of the fire, and it says, Where their worm dieth not. And again, you've heard and I've heard. People preach messages and, and tell you what the worm is, that it's the conscience, that it's the memory, that it's the thought of all the times they heard the gospel and rejected Christ. I can't vouch for any of that, but I can tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If that means that there are worms gnawing on those same eternal forms that are burning in that eternal fire... Then so be it. See, you're just, you're just being gross and disgusting and, and, and you're just trying to scare us. If I would, I, if I could, I would. I most certainly would. Because if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. Every time you step out those doors and get in your car and get on the road, you should be afraid. You should be afraid. Let me give you the time frame of hell. In Matthew chapter number 18, verse number 8, it says, everlasting fire. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and 45, the fire that shall never be quenched. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, everlasting punishment. If you're still in Revelation, look at chapter 14, verse number 11. We read it a few minutes ago. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What's the time frame of hell? It is all eternity. There is no stopping place. I know some of you theologians are thinking right now. You're saying, hold it, you've left something out. You, you've missed something. You've left out something very important. And I have. I have. And we're going to go pick it up right now. Go to Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. And verse number 12. There's a brief time period when those who are in hell tonight will be brought up out of that place and they will stand before God for their final judgment. We refer to it as the great white throne judgment. That's what it's talking about in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. Let's look at it. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Please notice that phrase. It's very important. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, again, according to their works. Those who are in hell tonight will be brought up out of that place and they will stand before God. And in that time when they stand before God, the books will be opened and they will be judged according to their works. You say, hold it, that means they're going to get a second chance. Surely, if they're judged according to their works, God will then take into account all of the things that they've done. All of the money that they've given, all of the time that they've spent, the sincerity of their heart, all of that will be taken into account. Let me just tell you tonight that if you ever stand before God to be judged on the basis of your works, there is no hope for you. Because God plainly declares that all of your righteousness is as filthy rags. There is none good. No, not one. But I've done good. And God says there is not one good. Not one. Not one. And they'll be brought up and stand before God and be judged according to their works. And there will probably be some at that moment that think that they're going to be taken out of hell because God somehow has made an awful mistake. And he missed all the good things that they did. And he missed the fact that they attended church. And he missed the fact that they put money in, a, in an offering plate or they gave to help people who were needy. And they'll declare their works before God. And I want you to look at verse number 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. All those who are brought up and stand before God at that great white throne judgment will then be gathered together and cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. So what is the time frame of hell? It is indeed everlasting. 
it is indeed for all eternity. By the way, that word that's used in Matthew chapter 18, verse number 8, where it says it's everlasting fire, and in chapter 25, verse 46 of Matthew, where it says it's everlasting punishment, that word everlasting, we like that word everlasting when it appears in a good context. For instance, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. We preach about everlasting life and we sing about everlasting life and we love the idea of everlasting life in the presence of God. Heaven and, and all that it has to offer. But that's the very same word that God used when he talked about hell and he said everlasting fire and everlasting punishment. That same everlasting eternity that we'll spend with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who do not know Christ will spend that same everlasting eternity in the torments of hell. The time frame of hell is that it lasts forever. Now, let me give you one more thing. The tenants of hell. Who will take up residence in that place? I think that's worth looking at, don't you? In Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 8, it tells us that the angels that rebelled against God, they have a place reserved in hell. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 41, tells us that hell was made for the devil and his angels. Revelation chapter 14, if you're still in that vicinity, go to Revelation chapter 14, verse number 9. We've read some of this, but I want to read it for you again. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Let me give you a little quick rundown. The next thing prophetically on God's calendar is what we call the rapture. The word rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. It's just the word that we use to describe what God says is going to happen. That's when all those who are saved will be taken up and caught up with the Lord Jesus Christ. When that happens, a time period on this earth is going to begin called the tribulation. That word is in the Bible. The first part of it will go pretty smoothly. And then about halfway through, the Bible calls it great tribulation. And that's where it gets really ugly. All of a sudden, everything goes bad. People will want to die. They will cry out and call out for rocks and mountains to fall on them and kill them and put them out of their misery. It will be an awful, awful time. During that tribulation period, if you want to pay your rent or buy food at the store or get gas for your car or whatever it is you want to do, you will have to have that mark in your forehead or your right hand. And if you don't have that mark, you won't be able to do business. You won't be able to survive. But if you take that mark, you will just have sealed forever a place for yourself in the lake of fire. There is no second chance. No second chance. You say, well, if I, if I see that rapture thing happen, I know some folks that I know for sure they're saved. And if I see that rapture thing happen and they disappear, I know what I'll do. I'll go get saved. After all, I've read some books and I've seen some movies and I know that's the way it works. Please don't ever get your theology from books and movies. You need to get it from this book. What does this book say? Let me tell you what this book says. This book says that when that rapture occurs, that God himself will send a strong delusion. And you won't know what happened. And you won't go get saved. You'll go down to the corner and get the mark in your hand, in your forehead, and you will spend eternity in hell. You had better get saved now while you have the chance. Oh, I know. You can, you can read the books and watch the films. But if you go down to the library and look for the books, you know what section you'll find them in? Fiction. You know why? Because they're fiction. They are fictionalized accounts of events that will occur. But in order to make a good story, you have to add some stuff. You've got to be careful adding stuff and taking stuff away. You better, you better go with what this book says. You better go with that.
Those who worship the beast, they'll have a place forever in the lake of fire. The beast and the false prophet, that's their final resting place. The devil himself in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 10, is cast into that place. Now go back to Revelation chapter 20, and we'll bring it a little closer to home. Revelation chapter number 20. We read verse 12, 13, and 14 about that judgment for those who are brought up out of hell and they're then cast into the lake of fire. Verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Anybody's name who does not appear in the Lamb's book of life. Anyone who has never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And had their name written in that wonderful book. They'll be reserved a place forever in the lake of fire. Now look, if you would, at Revelation chapter 21. Probably on the same page in your Bible. Verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's a, that's a pretty comprehensive list of those who will be there, isn't it? Notice that it says murderers and whoremongers and idolaters and abominable and, and liars. You say, well, I understand that. The murderer and the idolater. and Okay, I, I can see how that would happen. Maybe the liar, that's getting a little close to home, but, but I understand that. Look at the first two in the list. Fearful. Fearful and unbelieving. You don't have to be a murderer to go to hell. You don't have to worship an idol somewhere to go to hell. You don't have to be a whoremonger to go to hell. You don't have to be a liar to go to hell. Just be afraid. Just be afraid. Just be afraid of what somebody would say or think if you were to get saved. Just be afraid of that and let that keep you from trusting Christ and you will spend eternity in that place. Just be unbelieving. Be a good person. Go to church. Join a couple. Get sprinkled. Get spit on. Get it all. Be a good person. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Pay your taxes. Do all that stuff. Do it all. Be honest. Be a good neighbor. And you just make it through life, never having trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Never having believed in Him for your eternal salvation. Instead, believing in your own works or your, or your church or some other thing. Just make it through life without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have reserved your place forever in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible says. We just read that. You just saw that with your own eyes. I didn't make that up. That's what the Bible says right there in black and white. The fearful and the unbelieving go to the same hell as the murderer and the whoremonger and the idolater. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. It's the last place I'll have you turn tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Verse number 7 says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Isn't that something? Verse 8, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you have to do to go to hell? Just never obey the gospel. Just never come to that place in your life where you understand that you're a sinner and you need Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You just make it without getting to that point. And you will have never obeyed the gospel. And you will become the object of the wrath of Almighty God throughout eternity. That's not what I made up. That's not even what I like. But that's what the Word of God says. And it is true. Absolutely true true. How then do you obey the gospel? That's a good question, isn't it? 
In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, the question is asked, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's how you obey the gospel. You put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for you, and you obey the gospel. Anything other than that is not obeying the gospel. It's not obeying the gospel. You see, heaven is real, and that's a wonderful thing. But hell is real. It's not just a word to use to punctuate sentences. It's not just a fairy tale. It is a real place where real people will spend eternity. I have three brothers. My oldest brother has a disease called scleroderma. It's an unusual disease. It's rare. There are only a small percentage of the population that gets it. They don't know why you get it. They don't really know exactly what it is. There's no treatment for it. There's certainly no cure for it. It's always fatal. It's always terminal. It starts with a, a hardening of the skin. And it almost looks like you're swelling, but what's happening is your skin is thickening and getting hard. And, and then you get to the point where you can't bend your fingers and you can't close your hands. And, and patches on your body harden and thicken. And, and then it moves from the skin to the joints and the connective tissues so that your joints freeze up and they, they harden and they cease to work. And then it moves from there to your internal organs, your lungs, your stomach, your liver, your kidneys, your heart. And it begins to thicken and harden them. And when it does its work, eventually they stop functioning and you just die. That's the way it happens. Like I said, there's no, there's no known cause for it. There's no treatment for it. There's no cure for it. They try experimental treatments. Everything they try is experimental and it goes through periods like, like cancer where there's remission and then it comes back and then remission and it comes back. And he was, my oldest brother, Jim, was diagnosed in 1998. And he's had periods where it's progressed rapidly and he's lost a lot of function and, and the bottoms of his feet, the skin was so thick and hard. Of course, there was no feeling there and the bones began to poke through the bottoms of his feet. He can't use knives and things because he could cut himself and he no longer has feeling and, and he could bleed out before he realized that he was bleeding. So he doesn't use knives and things. He used to be a carpenter, worked with his hands all the time and he can't do that anymore. It's slowed down and speeded up and slowed down and speeded up. It's an awful, awful disease. He doesn't look like he used to look. It changes your skin. It changes your features. And it's going to kill him. He knows that. It's just a matter of time. And he will die from that disease or some complication due to that disease. The biggest problem is that Jim is not saved. He's not saved. And if he dies without the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, he will spend eternity in that place called hell. I'm not talking about somebody on the other side of the world that speaks a different language that I've never met that's my brother. And there may be family members in your home or your extended family who have the same story. Say, boy, if I, if I had a disease like that and I knew I was going to die, I'd get saved. You may die before he does. Oh, no, I'm young and I have a long time left. Oh, really? Do you now? If you go down and visit the cemetery, you'll find a very interesting phenomenon. You read the numbers on those headstones. You know what you'll find? You'll find that there are people in there who only lived a few hours. There are people in there who lived a few days. Some who lived a few months. Some who died as toddlers. Some who died as teenagers. Some who died in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. As a matter of fact, there's every age imaginable represented on the headstones down there at the cemetery because the truth is you don't know when you're going to die and it could be tonight the Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment then it is either heaven or hell for all eternity it's either heaven or hell you're going to spend eternity somewhere where will it be you say, well, I'm already saved, so I, I know I'm going to heaven. Good. I'm glad. That's wonderful. How about your family? How about your friends? 
How about the people next door? Have you ever even talked to the people next door? Have you given them a track or invited them to church or tried to witness? Have you done anything to let them know that there is an awful place to miss and a wonderful place to go? So, well, I sure wish the preacher would come by and witness to my neighbors. They need somebody to tell them about Jesus. Maybe that's why God put you there. As a matter of fact, that's probably why God put you there. Is because somebody needed to tell them about Jesus. Listen, you may be the only person who knows the truth that they know. Wouldn't it be a shame if they were to die and go to hell, having never heard from you that they didn't have to? Hell is a real place. A real place. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as Savior, you need to come tonight and get saved. Because the good news is you don't have to go there. And you ought to leave here tonight with the thought in your mind, I'm going to do something tomorrow to keep somebody else out of that place. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly